Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, a podcast by Filecoin Foundation that explores the intersection of blockchain and the data economy. Today, I'm joined by Marlon Tolley of Textile to discuss Bazin, which is the world's first data layer two built on Filecoin. Marla, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. So to get us started, why don't you tell us a bit about who you are and what you do at Textile? Yeah, for sure. So my name is Marla. Um, I head up uh, business development and partnerships for Textile. Um, I've been with Textile for about two and a half years now. Um, and previous to that, I worked in the uh, ad tech space. So uh, I spent some time at Snapchat, Microsoft, Verizon, um, all of the people collecting all of the data um, and selling ads in the space. Um, and it was really awesome, but I was always kind of looking for something um, new to learn. And I started uh, exploring via Ethereum and Bitcoin, this sort of blockchain space, um, and then realized data was like actually a big piece of the equation of what blockchain was solving for, um, not just digital currencies. And yeah, that led me down this path of looking for people that were sort of rethinking what data looked like. And that's how I found Textile. Cool. And then would you mind just giving us a bit of intro to Textile as well? You guys are kind of, uh, you know, pillars of the Filecoin ecosystem, but you kind of wear multiple hats. So maybe give us a quick intro as to what uh, what Textile does. Yeah, totally. So Textile has been in the ecosystem for many years before I started. So probably the better part of six or seven years, um, always building sort of developer tooling for the Filecoin ecosystem and just trying to um, find ways to make it um, easier, um, more accessible uh, to work within the Filecoin ecosystem, sort of with like understanding the Filecoin Filecoin sort of storage network uh, foundation um, was really solid. Uh, but there were all of these things to build on top to get the maximum value out of that. And so um, it's sort of a lab that's been operating in that way for a very long time. Um, about two and a half years ago, we launched Tableland, um, which we might touch on a little bit later. Uh, Tableland, uh, essentially a Web3 native SQL database, was a way to bring mutability um, to data that originated from blockchain. Um, and again, was like really sort of in parallel working with the Filecoin ecosystem as it related to um, data, sort of the data files themselves were being stored on Filecoin, but then there was this metadata that required mutability um, that would sit a layer up from that that data that was stored on Filecoin. Um, And then more recently, like you mentioned, um, we've launched Basin, which is the first data L2 uh, on Filecoin that we're really excited about. Um, and just sort of different to Tableland, the idea with Basin is this like super high throughput, um, large scale data uh, network that's all built on the Filecoin um, network. So let's talk more about Basin. Uh, it's a super cool project that you guys have deployed here. And, and you've also deployed it at, at what seems to be a, a very appropriate time uh, where there's a lot of interest in a, in a solution like this. Uh, so maybe tell us a bit more about what you've built it and what you've built here and then also like why you've decided to build this. Yeah, totally. Um, I'm glad to, to hear that you think it's, it's a good time. We feel the same way. Um, so essentially, it's a hot data layer um, built on the Filecoin network. Um, and it kind of has two components. So we have this decentralized object storage solution um, that is that hot data layer where folks um, like data producers can put data on Basin and make it available for a specific period of time. Um, and there's this programmable lifecycle management piece to it as well. Um, so the idea there being that data does need to be available near real time for many use cases, but it might not need to be available forever. And so it can be very obviously cost um, intensive to make it available forever. Um, and so the the hot layer is meant for um, sort of use cases like compute and things where, um, you know, you might need data around for weeks, um, but maybe not um, for the long haul. But then it also has a second component, which is this long-term archiving, and that is done through Filecoin. And so the idea being, you know, Filecoin has done a great job at building this distributed storage network um, that's super efficient, but obviously things like retrievability for hot use cases is not the focus there. And so the two are meant to work really well together so you can have uh, instant access via the hot storage and then long-term archiving via Filecoin. There's a few sort of things that led us down this path. Um, I'd mentioned a bit about Tableland. So Tableland um, is still active, actively being used 
um, but is really specific to builders that are fully building on chain. And so the reason for that is the way that Tableland works is um, every right to the database comes from a smart contract. So um, not super scalable as it relates to these like high volumes of data that might not be originating specifically from a blockchain. Um, we started having conversations with a lot of folks in the deep in space, um, folks that were starting to think about uh, artificial intelligence, um, how they would be training models, um, also just internet of things, like people that were collecting these large amounts of data, not necessarily on chain and needing somewhere to put it um, that that required some element of openness and decentralization and transparency, um, and then saw this need for um, a way to manage the data for these large scale data sets that weren't necessarily um, originating on a blockchain, because obviously that can be quite um, cost prohibitive. And that was sort of like the, the uh, start of Basin. Got it. Got it. So maybe walk us through like, maybe, I mean, I think we could talk maybe some about some of the theory behind it, like, okay, what are the benefits that this brings, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But like, maybe let's also talk about some of the practical kind of applications and projects. Like, I know you guys have been doing some work with like WeatherXM, for example. Uh, maybe walk us through how a project like WeatherXM would use this or, or drive benefits from a, a, a solution like this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So WeatherXM uh, is one of our earliest customers and also kind of helped us um, pave the way for what Basin is turning into today. Um, one of the really cool things, so for those um, maybe not familiar with WeatherXM, um, they're a deep in, so they basically allow people to purchase um, weather stations, deploy them at their home, um, and then they provide that weather data uh, to the network, and then the network goes out um, and makes that data available and usable for folks. Um, and monetization also being a piece of that, and then the attribution back to the originator of that data to get sort of compensated for having provided data into the ecosystem. Um, and so WeatherXM was a great example. They really wanted to be moving towards this like decentralized infrastructure to make sure that they're, they're providing this data weather in um, an open and transparent way that makes it really easy for people to um, collaborate over. And so we originally started working with them as just that. And so how they use Basin is um, they basically collect weather data from weather stations. They put those into Parquet files, um, and then those Parquet files are pushed to Basin, um, which then archives those into Filecoin, um, sort of for long-term archiving that they define um, sort of the requirements about how long they need that to live in Filecoin. The initial sort of thought for whether XM um, in this like early version of their use case is to enable collaboration. So the idea was they wanted it to be, um, there's all this data being created as they're moving towards monetization. They wanted to make sure that um, people could go in, access that data, you know, create analytics um, tables of that data, visualizations of weather um, and that sort of thing. The sort of progression of where we see um, our working relationship going um, kind of has a few different ways. So one um, actually POC that we did in tandem with WebStream and WeatherXM was showcasing how you could use sort of the hot storage piece of Basin to surface um, weather data that is then used to calculate rewards. And so mm. WebStream is a compute protocol. Um, the data from the weather stations becomes available on Basin. There is an algorithm that WeatherXM, WeatherXM has this quality of data sort of um, metric that they use to calculate rewards. So that compute could happen um, in this hot storage, but then that weather data doesn't need to remain hot after that, you know, rewards calculation has been done. And so you can then go ahead and archive that to Filecoin. Um, the sort of future version of that is um, being able to um, create proofs of those calculations and post them back on chain and then create these programmatic rewards flows um, that are all very open and transparent. So people who are contributing to that ecosystem of confidence um, in what their data is being used for and then how they're being rewarded for that data. Got it, guys. It makes a lot of sense, right? Because in an environment like that, if people don't feel, or if they can't like verify that they're being, that they're A, the data they're collecting is actually being used properly and then B, that they're being compensated fairly for that data that they're collecting, right? Uh, that the incentive structure kind of blows up a little bit, right? It doesn't really work if people don't have the confidence that that they're being 
you know, what's, what's being promised is not being delivered properly. Right. Yeah. So, um, the other thing with the weather data, um, and sort of like that idea of like confidence over the data is where did it originate from? And we're starting to see that same sort of, um, thesis emerge in data sets that are being used for multiple things. And so that kind of speaks to how we've progressed into this AI um, use case, which is exactly what you had mentioned earlier. Um, there's this like need for provenance and this need to understand where data originated from. The more people are starting to use uh, the same data sets for various different things. Got it. Got it. Um are there other kind of low hanging fruit use cases that that uh, or examples that might help folks to kind of better visualize how all this all, this all works in practice? Are there other uh, other examples that you'd you'd be like to highlight? Yeah, totally. So I think um, so. When we talk about AI, obviously there's such a like broad scope, and where we're at today with Basin, um, it's still all open. So all the data that is stored on Basin is open. Um, we're very much thinking about privacy. It's one of the things that comes up a lot, especially as we start thinking about monetization. But to just sort of like outline the, what the flow looks like um, from a high level, talking about open data is sort of the simplest thing to do at the moment. Um, and so some of the AI protocols that we've been speaking to collect um, data that's scraped from the internet. Um, that data is data that would be used for machine learning um, uh, into AI models. And in order for that data to sort of be usable, it needs to be held in a hot storage. So it needs to be somewhere where if somebody needs to go and train an AI model on it, they're able to access it pretty easily. Um, but they don't need it necessarily to be around forever because the value of data, assumably, goes down over time. So how recent is that data? How um, how much is it like? How how does the recency impact? Um, the ability to to train a model. And so what would happen in that case is instead of storing that data in like an S3 bucket on Amazon where access control becomes challenging because um, you're sort of you're limited to the organization with which you have um, AWS set up and you have to set up various um, access control metrics within that sort of closed ecosystem of S3, um, you could actually store that data on Basin um, make it available for collaborator collaborators who want to come in um, and use that data for their their model training. And then um, you might say, okay, in two weeks, this data isn't actually as useful for folks in the ecosystem. So we can archive it to Filecoin for a certain period of time. And then, you know, in the odd case, somebody does want to go in and download it, they can. Um, but it doesn't need to, you don't need to be paying for that hot storage um, indefinitely. Um, so, yeah, so that's sort of like the open model of it. I think what we're, we're working towards and we're working really closely with various organizations in the AI space to really understand their needs. Um, and a couple of things that have emerged there, um, I mentioned private data. So the ability to make that data private and have access control on who can actually go in and access that data and base in, but have those things um, be Web3 native. So be, um, you know, based on protocols and, and blockchains so that you can grant people permissions um, in a way that is traceable. Um, and so that's one thing that we're looking really closely at. And that really defines like the whole monetization in the AI space. So I think it's a really critical piece um, that is not lost on us. And it's something that we're working with various partners in the space who have their own solutions to try to see um, if we can work together to build something um, while we're also kind of taking this long view out to some of the interesting things that IPC makes available to us. So we're, we're um, building on the IPC framework. Um, so things like private subnets um, that could also make that available later down in our roadmap. Yeah. And maybe um, since you mentioned IPC, I was going to raise this a little bit later on in the, in the, in the episode, but uh, since you mentioned it now, maybe, Maybe just talk a little bit about how all of this fits into the into the Filecoin stack, uh, not just IPC, but then but then also the you know file using Filecoin as the the base storage layer. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the reason why we decided to build on IPC was really for like the horizontal scaling um, that's available via the subnets. And so um, essentially, what happens is the object store sort of gets updated into a subnet. There's various validators in that subnet. Um, they come into they come to consensus over state of um, that change in that object, and then that gets uh, checkpointed to the root subnet um, that then gets um, 
uh, stored on Filecoin from there. Um, and so the horizontal scaling and the availability to make this all sort of really uh, quick and inexpensive um, is all based on sort of the IPC framework. And so that was um, really the the impetus of us working working um, on that. And it really is what enabled Basin to exist. So we started looking at what we were going to build, I guess it was a year ago now, we first started doing our user research on what people were looking for. Um, this was still super early days and not necessarily something that was possible. Um, but now with IPC having advanced the way that it has, um, it's made it possible to run this at a super um, near real time speed, which is what people are looking for. Um, and then in terms of the Filecoin network, I mean, I just think that like we're, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel on a storage protocol. Like we think Filecoin's done an exceptional job. Some of the concepts that we are sort of um, toying around with, though, are um, keeping data really close together. So being able to use the Filecoin network um, where storage providers are already providing storage from a long-term archiving perspective from Filecoin, um, and then being able to also provide this hot storage layer for us would allow um, people who need to store their data to have you know, relationships with different validators um, that are well poised because they're already working in the Filecoin ecosystem and storing those large amounts of data um, and have the infrastructure to support that. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you for that explanation. That, that's super helpful for just understanding how all these things kind of fit together. Um, I wanted to kind of turn back to the AI question here a bit more. And I know, um, you know, there's lots of talk about you know, like how we train AI models and there's going to be an AI model for this and an AI model for that. Uh, but at the end of the day, these are still kind of like, they're just like garbage in garbage out, you know, the same way as any, any other software program. Right. And there's really kind of this whole process of making the data set usable and digestible before it can be really like usefully trained in a, in, in a, in a model. And it seems like this is one of the problems that you guys are attempting to solve with, with, with Bayesian here is basically making these, giving the tools to make these, these data sets, uh, through the, some of the collaborative processes and being able to open these data sets up to more, uh, you know, you know, more like broader access controls and things like that. Um, maybe talk a bit about like, I guess that whole like data preparation process of like why you need, you know, a, a tool like this or why a tool like this is helpful for basically getting the data set like optimized to be used usefully in, in one of these models. Yeah, totally. I think, um, I mean, I think there's just a lot of players in the space that are doing a really good job at aggregating data um, and helping in sort of like making data sets available for folks and hugging face is one, um, you know, bagel is, is creating sort of a decentralized version of that. And we're certainly not trying to, um, necessarily play in that space, but we are trying to provide the data infrastructure piece that powers, um, what these folks are already doing. And I think like one of the biggest things that we've been hearing is that labeling that you mentioned. So labeling of data, making sure it's um, it's really easy to find what it is that you're looking to access um, and then making sure that data is accessible and then making sure that the right people can access that data. So those are sort of like the workflows that we're really looking to solve is um, how do you take all of these vast amounts of data and then organize them and then put them in a place where people are confident that they're going to be available. And that's one of the really core things to base in is that data availability guarantee. So you know that that data is going to be there when you need it to be there. Um, and so when people need to go in and access um, those machine learning models, um, that they are going to be there. The other piece that we're hearing is super critical that um, would be helpful. So in these, in these worlds where these data sets are being surfaced is the idea of prominent provenance and verification. So there's like there's sort of like two worlds. One is is um, sort of this real data is being created. People are classifying that data, and then um, they need to know where that data originated from. And that's pretty critical as it relates to things like making sure that um, you know you are giving some assurances or guarantees on the model that you're creating or the agent that you're creating. Then you need to know the data that went into it because the data that went into it is is really critical to the quality of the output of the agent. And so understanding the origin of that data is really important. So that's one piece that, that Basin um, is really focused on. 
solving for and being able to allow not just provenance of the origination, but then also derivative data sets. So you might consume a data set and then turn it into something else. And then there's a derivative of that data set that gets used um, in a, in a process down the road. And so those, um, those primitives sound like things that um, these networks aren't necessarily looking to solve for. And that's, and that's where basin um, is hoping to play. The other space that we find really interesting um, that is still sort of like, I think a new concept in the crypto sphere, but maybe not so much in the AI sphere is the concept of synthetic data um, and the ability to create, you know, like 10 X the amount of data that we currently are creating um, and doing that using AI to sort of generate these synthetic data sets. Um, and then with synthetic data sets, it also becomes something like Basin becomes really interesting as well, because you kind of have the ability to attach provenance and derivative um, classifications, but you also are able to make that data, pay for that data to be used for only a set period of time. And so data costs are obviously like a big concern and a big question mark. And um, especially with synthetic data, it's probably really valuable. It's, it's extremely valuable to get the volume to train the models, but it doesn't need to be around for a super long period of time. And so we're helping people sort of manage their costs of data storage by being able to kind of have these like um, programmable life cycles of, of how they make that data available. So what do you mean by synthetic data exactly? Like what would be an example of that? So synthetic data is actually being used um, primarily right now in a lot of like market research type things at the enterprise level. So um, what essentially happens is you have a real set of data. So say a questionnaire that's been taken and then you have an AI um, machine learning protocol that will ingest that data and create a generative version of it that is statistically up to 95% as similar as the originating data. Um, but it's a new set of data. And so in that scenario, what it's allowing people to do is to uh, not have to worry about privacy concerns the same way. So like not mm, okay. you know, being able to, to surface PII and that sort of thing. Um, the other place that it's being used very commonly in is, is um, like computer vision modeling and, and um, like 3D image modeling. So if you, for example, needed to see uh, 150,000 different iterations of um, what a supply chain um, setup might look like, rather than actually having to wait for all of those things to happen, um, and then feeding that into a data set, you can sort of work off of a sample set of a small sample set of potential outcomes and then put that into a generative AI um, interface that would turn that into 150,000 data sets. Um, and then you can use those to sort of make um, decisions. But in the context of sort of the crypto world and um, I think the AI agents that we're looking to build, synthetic data is sort of poised to be a way to create large amounts of data off of the data that we already have. So we've scraped a ton of data off the internet, um, but the ability for more data now to be created in order to train models beyond what we've already scraped is becoming limited. And so synthetic data has become this way of uh, creating vast amounts of data off of what we've already sort of been able to aggregate in order to move the intelligence and the training forward. Yeah, that's super interesting. Uh, that sounds like a whole new frontier, to be honest. <laughs> gonna, it does. And, and, and it is, <laughs> yeah, and it totally is for us as well. Um, but something we've been really interested in because it is actually a very common, um, like if you look at, you know, NVIDIA and others, it's it's a IBM, they're all talking about synthetic data, um, but it hasn't really made its way too much into our world just yet. But I do think it's coming. Got it. Got it. Okay, well, we'll be on the lookout for that. <laughs> Sounds yeah, important. Definitely. Uh, so I want to go back uh, to something else you touched on earlier, which is really the monetization angle. And um, obviously, you know, it, it, I mean, this is sort of like, you know, data is the new oil and, you know, this, is, this, is, this isn't necessarily a new thesis or at all. But like, maybe just talk about uh, some of the data, monetiz sorry, data monetization opportunities that uh, can be unlocked through a, a, a protocol like Bazin. And uh, maybe like walk us through a couple of practical examples of, of like how this could work. Like say I'm, 
you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm like a university or a research institution that has uh, like a, a genomic research data set or something. Um, you know, like what could I do with that potentially to, uh, you know, to monetize that data set using like a protocol like this? Like how would that work sort of conceptually? Yeah, for sure. So I think there's kind of, there's a couple pieces um, to the monetization or sorry, the monetization angle. So I think like maybe taking a, a step back um, to the data question, because I think the data piece is like, is a clear part of the whole, like, why are we even going decentralized and what does blockchain have to do with any of it? And so um, data monetization is obviously not a new concept. I think the the new piece of the concept is who is owning data and then who is getting value back for the data that is created. And that's like the big question mark, I think that like blockchain is trying to solve and what many deepens are trying to solve. And so the way that Basin is being designed is not necessarily reinventing the wheel of monetization. So if somebody has a data set, um, they want to make that available to monetize. They want specific people to be able to access that data because they've you know, agree to pay a certain amount um, in order to access that data, whether that be in their tokens or however they want to do that. Um, but I think the piece that makes things more interesting and, and trickier is the attribution piece. And so that's like, I think the big question that um, a protocol like Basin is going to be in, the, in a really nice position to solve, which is how do you attribute where that data originated from? And then keep on sort of following it until it gets monetized in many different ways and then make sure that when it is monetized the creators of that data are compensated in a way that is fair and then making sure that that's all something that is is auditable and verifiable so that the the people in the ecosystem continue to be incentivized to do the things that we're trying to get them to do so i think like um on from that perspective i think that's where basin plays a really interesting role. Um, I think as it relates to like ways that monetization could potentially change and shift as we go forward, um, I want to give credit where credit is due. I was um, chatting with uh, Danny from Ceramic the other day, and um, I come from the ad tech space, so this kind of like resonated with me. But one of the other things that I think is really interesting is is how he put it, which is, what AI is potentially poised to do and what all of this like labeling um, and classification of data uh, could help improve is instead of creating all these data sets, making them available and then saying, Hey, here's the data that's available. You guys can come in now and monetize it and use it as you'd like. Um, what we're getting closer to is a world where people can actually say like, here's the data that I'm, I'm trying to find. Like, this is the thing that I'm trying to solve for. This is the question that's being asked of an, like an AI agent or, um, you know, this is the person that I want to speak to or whatever that might be. And then putting that out into a network and then having the data actually be created to answer those questions. So it's sort of like flipping the script a little bit and making data a little bit more useful because the data that gets created um, or the way that it's labeled or the way that it's mixed and matched between different data sets can actually be used um, and delivered to a final end user in a way um, that addresses their original ask versus just passing a data set onto them um, and then having them kind of have to do the like work of dissecting it all and making it fit the use case. I um, mean, I think that's that's a really interesting way of looking at how um, intelligence could play into this and, and recraft the way that we uh, we access and monetize data. So that's super interesting. Kind of trying to reverse engineer the process a little bit, right? Instead of being like, "Here, here's a like, uh, here's a data set. Like, have fun, right?" Like, I yeah, remember totally. what, A couple like a decade or so ago, when the U.S. government started, they, they they embarked on this kind of like open data initiative. Like, we're going to make all of our data like open and public, and which is which is you know a good you know certainly a, a, a noble cause. But they're just kind of like dumping all these data sets out to the public. It's like, here, like, have fun, like totally. <laughs> so like, if you okay, could like, go in there and say, okay, the, like ask a question. This is specifically what I'm looking for. You know, what are the like water quality rates in these different places, and is there a correlation to cancer or something like that? You know, like putting that in, and then actually being able to surface relevant data, I think would be really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, kind of making this whole process a bit more like user friendly and, and just more calculated, I guess, or targeted. Um, I guess one other final question I wanted to throw your way here um, is, 
and this is this kind of ties back to what we were the, the earlier question about how you guys fit into the Filecoin uh, stack. Essentially, um, there does seem to be um, like some perhaps confusion or like misconceptions about like between. I guess there's a differentiation between data storage and data availability, right? So you have like data availability first kind of came onto the scene, you know, what like a year ago or so with with like Celestia and the whole kind of modular stack thesis, right? And then it seems like there's kind of some misconceptions about like, okay, like what are these things? Is, is, are they the same thing? Are they different? Like, how do they relate? Like, what's the, um, so anyway, so I, I was wondering if maybe you guys, I mean, since you're obviously kind of Bazin is, is sort of, uh, involved in both of these elements here, I was wondering if you could maybe, uh, like distinguish that or how, how would you distinguish that those two, to, uh, maybe a lay person perhaps. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the Filecoin storage network is designed to store files um, at the end of the day. So you're looking at, you know, files of any size are stored in this sort of coordinated network, you know, that they're that those items are actually going to be there and they're going to be available, um, which is probably where the data availability um, confusion and then question comes comes in Um, the the difference there, I guess, is the retrievability. So, um, you know, Filecoin is meant to archive your files and to be able to to go and access those files. But the actual uh, network, which I look at as sort of like the base layer. So there's this like network um, of validators that are storing the actual things, um, the files that need to be stored. And those are archived for long periods of time. And there's a coordination layer there to make sure that um, they are there and available um, and they don't go away, um, and that you can access them. Then there's these tools built on top of that storage layer, and that is um, to make the the data sort of usable in everyday applications. So things that um, you need to do to sort of power the, the day-to-day things that you're doing on the internet. Um, and that's where I think we come in. So that's like this hot data storage layer um, where we're not, if we were to try to keep all of the data that's available on Filecoin hot for forever, it would be in, in ridiculous uh, amount of money and it just wouldn't make sense and um, and people wouldn't use it. So I, that's, I don't think that makes sense. And so that's where this like hot data availability layer comes in. Um, but to add I, even a little bit more of complexity, I think to that is, um, so Basin operates as an object storage solution. So we have like blobs of data that we're making available in this hot layer um, and then ultimately archiving to Filecoin where it's still available, but um, archived and, and less retrievable. And um, and those are still pieces of like actual like hard data. Um, whereas oftentimes when you hear about data availability, um, that's like transaction data and things. So that's actually like not, you know, files and things that are being held in a hot layer. So I think there's um, sort of these these different levels of what we call data availability. So we even hesitate to call it data availability, but um, it, the reality of it is there are blobs storage of data that um, our network guarantees is going to be available in near real time for use um, for things like compute um, or other uh, application retrieval things that need to happen quickly. Got it, got it. Uh, well, thank you for that. That's that's a helpful way of putting it. Um, well, Marla, I really want to thank you for your time. Thank you for coming on the show here. Uh, I'll give you the final, uh, f- you know, final word. Uh, and then how can uh, folks get in touch if they want to learn more about uh, about textile or about Bazin? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think the probably easiest way is you can go to basin.textile.io. Um, if you go there, you'll be able to connect with us on Discord uh, follow us. Um, you can request to talk to us about a POC, or you could even go ahead and uh, access the SDK there if you wanted to start playing with it uh, today. Amazing. Well, thanks so much, Marla, for your time. And uh, thanks everyone for watching and we will see you next time. Thanks so much.